Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Friday night study that we've been doing on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And over the last little while, last few weeks, we've been reading 1888 Reexamined by uh, Robert Wieland and Donald Short. And it's something that I had read back in the 80s when it came out. Um, and it's nice to be reading it again after so long a time. But there's lots of background here about what happened in 1888. Uh, so they pulled together uh, a really good picture of, of the rejection and uh, the aftermath of, of that. Now, there are things I disagree with them about, uh, but part of that is just perspective from where they're at the time that they're writing, we obviously see things that they don't see. Um, but anyway, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and for the time that we have to open your word, to study, to have fellowship. We know the Sabbath has passed for some. We know, Lord, that... I think everyone here, it's the Sabbath now. And uh, we just ask that your Holy Spirit can be here, that you can unite our hearts and our minds as we study your word together. We pray uh, for the studies tomorrow as well. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you can watch over each person. I pray for my wife, who um, has some issues that she needs resolved. And just pray for her. And take care of her health, and um, that you can help her with her stomach pain. And uh, so be with each of us in this study. Enlighten our minds. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Good evening once again. Yeah, I prayed for Heidi there because she's at the hospital. She has severe stomach pains, and she doesn't know what it is. So we're going to try to find out what it is. She hasn't had these before. So we're praying that she'll be okay. Uh, something minor. But, uh, anyway, so if you can keep her in your prayers. Um, so this study here, we were reading from 1888, re-examined. And now we're, we're dealing with um, the idea of what happened in the rejection of 1888, that there is a parallel with uh the Jews' rejection of Christ. So you can see, of course, we have this light colored. That's going to be Wagner and Short's writings. And then we're going to have these bulls. A lot of this is spirit of prophecy. Um, never since the rejection by Israel of her king of glory has the heavenly universe witnessed a more inexcusable and shameful failure on the part of the chosen people of God led by their leaders. The Lord's messenger did not hesitate to apply to the leading brethren the famous woes upon the Pharisees from Luke 11, verse 50 to 52, and emphasized their present, that is 1896, application. If God has ever spoken by me, these scriptures mean very much to those who shall hear them. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering ye hindered. From Testimonies to Ministers, page 76. Such is the true picture of the great revival, which followed the 1888 meeting. Many lay members and younger ministers began to enter in, but the elders at Jerusalem verily hindered them. Thus the revival proved abortive, and the Holy Spirit was grieved, insulted, and quenched. Frequently, the Lord's messenger compared the anti-1888 spirit to the Jews' rejections, rejection of Christ, for example. Light has been shining upon the church of God that many have said by their indifferent attitude, we want not that way, O God, but our own way. The kingdom of heaven has come very near, but they have barred the door of the heart and have not received the heavenly guests. For as yet they know not the love of God. There is less excuse in our day for stubbornness and unbelief than there was for the Jews in the days of Christ. 
our sin and its retribution will be the greater if we refuse to walk in the light. Many say, if I had only lived in the days of Christ, I would not have rested his words or falsely interpreted his instruction. I would not have rejected and crucified him as did the Jews. But that will be proved by the way in which you deal with his message and his messengers today. Those who live in this day are not accountable for the deeds of those who crucified the Son of God. But if with all the light that shone upon his ancient people delineated before us, we travel over the same ground, cherish the same spirit, refuse to receive reproof and warning, then our guilt will be greatly augmented. Now that's um, I guess still testimonies to ministers, I think. I'm not sure. Try to figure out where this is from because they have that IBID. But it's April 11th, 1893. It might be um, from some, I'm not sure. I should, I've got to look back. Where is this, where is this quoting from? Because you keep getting this bit thing. Um, so I'm not really sure. Review and Herald, March 18th, 1890. Um, testimonies to ministers, 1895. I don't know. It, it's not clear. I, I hate when people do that. You can't figure out where, where it's at. The quote is from. But anyway, um, one of the things that's interesting here is she uses the word delineated. So she says, his ancient people delineated before us. Or the light that shone upon his ancient people is delineated before us. So we know delineated means to set upon a line. And, and she's using this as a repeat of history. So the idea that we're repeating the history of the time of Christ in 1888 um, is something that we understand, but not every Adventist understands what it means some, when something is delineated to be set upon a line. So that line is a reform line. And so... We know that what happened in 1888 has also happened again within uh, Adventism. So, for instance, the message that was given um, to the Adventist church regarding the, the 2520 and the repeat of Millerite history, which has been rejected. Um, and also within the movement, we see again and again that when light comes, people, instead of addressing you know, in a, in a, a spirit of Christ, whatever is to be studied, they attack the messengers, right? So they, they crucify the messengers. So, so that happened in 1888 in that history and afterwards, and that's happening today in our history. Those who are filled with unbelief can discern the least thing that has an objectionable feature. They can lose sight of all the evidences that God has given in revealing precious gems of truth from the inexhaustible mind, mine of his word. And they can hold the objectionable Adam under the magnifying glasses of their imagination until the Adam looks like a world and shouts out from their view the precious light of heaven. Why take so much account of that which may appear to you as an object as objectionable in the messenger, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, and sweep away all the evidences that God has given to balance the mind in regard to truth. So we know that when people are attacking a messenger rather than the message, that that, that is a great danger. Right? So if somebody's teaching error, you can address it by revealing truth. But if somebody's teaching truth and you want to reject it, you have to misrepresent it and misrepresent the messengers. So our imagination struggles to grasp the reality of the blessings that would have come to the Seventh-day Adventist church if this precious message had been heartily accepted. Okay, so now we know that it wasn't just that the message was rejected in 1888. We know that prior to that, the first and second angels messages had been rejected. So there was, there was no way that this message could be fully accepted by the leadership. And, and, and though, you know, many people rejoiced in what they heard because of the politics involved, um, it hindered the work that was supposed to be accomplished by this message. But it really goes back even further. 
If through the grace of Christ, his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with new wine. God will give additional light and all truths will be recovered and replaced in the framework of truth. And wherever the laborers go, they will, they will triumph. So now they're going to deal with this upside down history. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting um, expression. I, I, because when we think about upside down, what does that remind us of? Turning things upside down, I think that's in uh, Isaiah. Second, King. Second Kings. Oh, Second Kings, okay. Second Isaiah. Second Kings. Yeah, that's going to be Second Kings chapter 21, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Right, so therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth it, Heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet in the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So I just think it's interesting that, that they talk about this upside down history. But anyway, let's, let's read what he has to say, why he's saying it's upside down history. What should have taken place, but what didn't, was made plain in a statement made at the 1901 General Conference session when Ellen, Ellen White referred back to the 1888-1891 crisis. What our historians have assumed was revival turns out to be only a verbal assent um, with no genuine reformation. That is, people made an assent, we accept this message, but they didn't, right? It was just more a political accepting of the message because Ellen White was so clear that it was a message from God. So people would sometimes repent of, you know, well, I guess we accept the message now, but in reality they didn't. And, but anyway, let's, let's go on and read. So uh, the general conference bulletin from 1901 is a must read uh, what Ellen White says about that and all the other things going on there in 1901. Um, and, and we might end up looking at that at some point. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I feel a special interest in the movements and decisions that shall be made at this conference regarding the things that should have been done years ago, and especially 10 years ago, when we were assembled in conference and the spirit and power of God came into our meeting, testifying that God was ready to work for his people if they would come into working order. The brethren assented to the light God had given, but there were those connected with our institutions, especially the Review and Herald Office and the General Conference, who brought in elements of unbelief so that the light given was not acted upon. It was assented to, but no special change was made to bring about such a condition of things that the power of God could be revealed among his people. Now, when we think about this, why is it that leadership ends up rejecting light? You know, why is this particularly the leadership, the institutions that end up rejecting light? I don't know. I think they, they think everything has been said has been said or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, I would think one of it, one of the things, the elements is uh, control. So, yeah, there you go. Bullseye. Yeah, people, people control, 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 yeah. control for sure. But also there's the pride of the intellect and they're the learned men. And how, how well, that, can Jesus know any of these things, not having letters? Yeah. So and how can a average, average church member know more than them? You know, it's, so so the reason why they think they should be in charge is because they know better. Right. To allow God to just take care of things and, and to allow God to work through others, um, that takes a lot of faith and trust in God. You know, one of the things I really like about Jeff or liked about him in the past is that he was willing to listen to light wherever it came from. 
He was not a respecter of persons when it came to receiving light. And, you know, he would listen to me even, right? So the fact that he would even listen to somebody like me, who's not, you know, particularly important in any way, um, and, and also not liked by a lot of people, a lot of people felt threatened, but he would still listen. And that's something that I, I, I admired in him. Now, he's become distrustful in listening to others because of the directions that things went in the movement. So the idea that he has now is that he should never have listened to anyone and that that was a mistake. But of course, I think the mistake is to believe that he made a mistake. So, but, but anyway, just dealing with leadership in general, or people who are in charge, they often think more of themselves than they ought, that they are there really as servants um, and to allow God to work. But sometimes people get in their minds that because God has used them in the past, um, that means that they are to be listened to in the present. And when God takes the work into his own hands, we're not going to be looking to people. It's because each of us will be looking to God and trusting in God. So it, it's it's something that just human nature um, that we have to recognize. And we need to recognize it in ourselves before we recognize it in others. So some of the brethren recognized in 1893 that because Reformation had been refused, revival had consequently failed, Jones said. Brethren, the time has, has come to take up tonight what we there, Minneapolis four years before, rejected. Not a soul of us has ever been able to dream yet the wonderful blessings that God had for us at Minneapolis, um, which would have been enjoying these four years. If hearts had been ready to receive the message which God sent, we would have been four years ahead. We would have been in the midst of the wonders of the loud cry itself tonight. So we had read that in the General Conference Bulletin from 1893. So Jones is quite clear that the message was rejected and that they hadn't received the blessings of that message. So the narrative that says, you know, we eventually all received the message. There's only a few people that really ultimately rejected it. And we're, we had a great revival because of the message. That's not the way the messengers perceived uh, the reception of that message. And definitely not the way Ellen White saw it. Uh, the following letter from Ellen White read at the same session explains how the process worked by which the 1888 message was turned into defeat. The opposition in our ranks has imposed upon the Lord's messengers a laborious and soul trying task. For they have yet, for they have had to meet difficulties and obstacles which need not have existed. All the time and thought and labor required to counteract the influence of our brethren who opposed the message has been just so much taken from the world of the swift, of the swift coming judgments of God. The spirit of God has been present in power among his people, but he could not be bestowed upon them because they did not open their hearts to receive it. It is not the opposition of the world that we have to fear, but it is the elements the work among ourselves that have hindered the message. Love and confidence constitute a moral force that would have united our churches and ensured harmony of action. But coldness and distrust have brought disunion that has shorn us of our strength. The influence that grew out of the resistance of light and truth at the Minneapolis at Minneapolis tended to make of no effect the light of God had given to his people through the testimonies. Because some of those who occupy responsible positions were leavened with the spirit that prevailed at Minneapolis, a spirit that beclouded the discernment of the people of God. So, um, so one of the things that we can say about um, this history, we can see the parallel in our own movement. Have we seen coldness and distrust in this movement? And the question is, what about us individually? Have we been uh, hypercritical of those around us, those that that we feel have criticized us, that we 
we acted in the same manner that they have acted. I could raise, I could raise my hand on that. Yeah. It, it's the one thing we always have to be, be careful of. I mean, even back, you know, back in 2019, when Armander and those left, um, the spirit and the attitude, the mocking that we saw within the movement of those who stayed um, was really shameful. It should never have, have been. That spirit has been in this movement for a long time, and it still exists. And it's something that exists because it's in our hearts. And and we would crucify Christ just as readily as as the Jews. We would we would be there to criticize uh, Jones and Wagner, right? We're we're no different than the than anyone else. You know, by God's grace, you know, we would accept it, but it's contrary to human nature to accept the truth. So they go on here. Um, an army that loses a battle will try afterwards to discover why the defeat took place. They will speak of victory only in the conditional subjunctive mood of the verb as what might have been. It is significant that the oft-quoted passage published in 1909 in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 29, which begins with a tragic if, was written concerning the results of the 1888 history. It is the next sentence after the above quotation. If every soldier, soldier of Christ had done his duty, if every watchman on the walls of Zion had given the trumpet a certain sound, the world might ere this have heard the message of warning. But the work is years behind. What account will be rendered to God for thus retarding the work? And this is true of our movement as well. Satan has managed to turn us against each other. And the efforts that should be taken in presenting a message uh, to the Adventist church and to the world um, has been directed inward. And it's a shame. But the only change that can happen is with us. Now, uh, the next section is called There's Good News in the 1888 History with an exclamation mark. Okay. This does not mean that the war has been lost, far from it, only a battle was lost. I have here, however, a most intriguing situation. A few paragraphs later in the same letter, Ellen White predicted that Satan will work up his advantage skillfully. The deep plotting of Satan will reveal its working everywhere. He will be far too keen to make the blunder of assuming the livery of the devil. He would pretend to be the Christ. The appearance of a false Christ will arouse delusive hopes in the minds of those who will allow themselves to be deceived. Satan is too keen minded to claim his victory before it is complete, even though the partial victory is true. Such boasting would drive the remnant church to her knees in the repentance of the ages, for she is honest at heart. Uh, Telling her the truth will never work. She must be kept in deception until the very last. Therefore, Satan's desire is that we should be deceived about our 1888 history. He will slyly admit defeat and concede the victory, pretending to lie prostrate at our feet. But the deception, if cherished, can lead only to an infatuation with the false Christ. If we cannot read the past right, how will we be able to interpret the future correctly as it unrolls before our eyes? So, um, I don't know if I quite fully understand what he's saying here. So, uh, the idea is that Satan, instead of going in a full force battle, I guess is, is that he's going to concede, um, you know, concede the victory, right? He's going to, the church and, and the movement, I mean, in some ways, we can see that people just say, oh, the message is accepted, but in reality, it isn't, right? There's so much that has been done to put Adventists to sleep um, through our history so that we we don't recognize our danger. Now, one of the dangers I see um, that 
that is not really discerned generally by Seventh-day Adventists is we know that there's all kinds of errors that have come into Adventism. Um, you know, back in the 90s, you you would not have seen all of the different winds of doctrine that you see today. You wouldn't have seen, you know, the character of God people. I mean, maybe they were starting a little bit there. Um, but it just, none of these things really took any hold. Uh, but after... Um, after 9-11, and of course, even more recently with what's happened with the pandemic, it, it seems like there's hardly anyone who just believes simple, basic Adventism. There's all kinds of feast keepers, lunar Sabbatarians, anti-Trinitarians. Anti, um, um, and, and some of these, I mean, some of the, the errors have some bits of truth in them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be very attractive. But the enemy is not these winds of doctrine. Those who sort of stand and, and believe that they're the watchmen and they're going to correct every error that comes along, uh, they're caught in a battle that we are not to fight. What is it that we're supposed to do? Are we to be apologists for the truth? Or are we, that is, dealing with, with all the different errors and arguing about all of these different things and why they're wrong? Or should we be presenting the gospel, the everlasting gospel? Should we be presenting the truth? And, and in presenting the truth, then we can undo the error. But if we have nothing to offer people, then they're going to go other places. And so I think it's one one thing that we have to really think about as this movement develops uh, um, an understanding of the message that God has given us and how to give that message to others. We know it has to be not just an argumentative message. It needs to be a life-changing message. It needs to be the everlasting gospel. <clears throat> Um, do these obvious truths paint a dark or discouraging picture? Not if we love him who says he is the truth. Recognizing truth is the only way to come close to him. While it is true that our history is a clear call to repentance, we must remember that calls to repentance have always been upbeat, positive, hope-inspiring, and encouraging. Those who portray our 1888 history as a glorious victory are very sincere. They desire to preserve the unity of the church. Critics have arisen claiming that the victory gained by Satan in 1888 and thereafter was complete, so that the church is now in a hopeless condition, right? So people are going to say the church is Babylon, right? But this is not true. But such a false idea takes root and flourishes as a reaction against the pride and complacency which deny the truth of our history for generation after generation. Israel will never become Babylon, though she may have her periods of captivity. The Lord will bring her again to her own borders, chastened and repentant. So this is, of course, a um, one of those issues. If you if you look back at when this book is published in 1887 or 1987, um, there definitely were groups that were calling the church Babylon. Now, we know that the church is not Babylon, but it can be in captivity. And so when you're calling people out of Babylon, you're calling people out of captivity. You're not necessarily saying the church is Babylon, but the church is captive. Now, the distinction may not be um, clear to everyone, but we know as a symbol that the church can't be Babylon itself, that we're not to call the church out of Babylon or, or the people out of the church. I mean, but we are to call the church out of Babylon. That is the church is in Babylon. Its members are in captivity. That is part of our message. But there's been so much prejudice about people who say negative things about the church that the church has built up a barrier and um, so to call people out of Babylon, 
I don't think the key is to, you know, talk about all the sins of the church and everything that the church has done wrong and how it's so bad and how you need to lead the church. This is really a call to individuals for themselves to come out of Babylonian thinking. It's, it's a call to individuals, not to the organization. So um, in seeking to counteract disloyal critics who condemn the church as hopeless, we must not deny the truth. Let us ascribe honor to whom it is due, that in the light of our past history will require that we be greatly humbled. There will be great humbling of hearts before God on our part, on the part of everyone who remains faithful and true to the end. Um, so, so this is manuscript 15, 1888, um, in the book by Olson. Unless the church, which is now being leavened with her own backsliding, shall repent and be converted, she will eat of the fruit of her own doing until she abhor herself. Okay, so the church is in a bad shape, but to get the, to just point out that the church is in a bad shape and that you need to leave the church is not of the everlasting gospel because the church is not Babylon. The church is captive to Babylon. That experience is no evidence that God will have cast off his church. Peter, when he threw himself on the ground in Gethsemane and wished that he might die, was at last converted. When the above words are fulfilled, the remnant church will likewise be converted. Her Pentecost will be no further away at that time than Peter's was when he came to know himself and in so doing found his Lord's forgiveness. So this is the difference between uh, Whelan and Short and myself. But part of it is we are in a different time. So we know that the church as an institution, just like the Jews of old, did the Jewish church survive after crucifying Christ? It's a trick question, but I mean, we know that the Jews as a nation are going to be destroyed, not completely, but their temple is going to be destroyed. They're going to be scattered, right, and continue to be scattered. Um, and, and that scattering is going to continue uh, all through the rest of the 1260 from 723 to 538. But we do know that God does raise up his church at that time, the Christian church. And God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church. Just because the church is not Babylon doesn't mean that it's it's not going to fall. The church falls. And so we've seen that. Um, so the idea that the church as an institution is somehow going to be converted, I don't see how that's possible. I mean, in the condition that it's in present. So I disagree with him here. Um, but it doesn't mean that Seventh-day Adventists are all lost or that, you know, pastors are all lost. But as an institution, it's not going to survive what's coming. So that's my position. A true understanding of the 1888 experience will figure largely in our coming to know ourselves. Sometime it will be seen in its true bearing with all the burden of woe that has resulted from it. General Conference Bulletin, 1893, page 184. A.T. Jones at the 1893 meeting also referred to that long delayed sometime of reparation. There will be things to come that will be more surprising than, than that was to those at Minneapolis. But unless you and I have every fiber of that spirit rooted out of our hearts, we will treat that message and the messengers by whom it is sent as God has declared we have treated this other, um, this other message, right? So if we're going to look at what Jones is saying, is that, has there been another message that's more than, more surprising, um, than the message given in 1888. Can we see that this movement is that message that Jones is speaking of? 
Can we believe that? Yeah. Believe that. I mean, it's hard to believe to some degree that, you know, God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Because this movement, out of all the movements that have claimed to be the movement uh, for this time, and there's lots of different ideas, all these winds of dark. Uh, the one difference you will see with this movement is what? What is the difference about this movement over every other movement that has come uh, to Adventist? Probably chronology is one. Okay, well, that's not what I'm really thinking about. I mean, obviously there's chronology, but that's not the thing that makes it the message. The main thing that makes it the message is that it is a repeat of Millerite history. It's a repeat of the first, second, and third angels' messages, right? Yeah, yes. And, and we can show it because we have an understanding of Millerite history that no one has. We can place those messages. We can, I mean, there's just so much evidence, so much that has unfolded from Millerite history in this movement. That's one of the problems I have with what Jeff is saying uh, regarding um, that the light that came after 2012 was darkness. So he's, he's basically kicking out um, or discarding the unfolding of Millerite history that came beginning in 2013 with the understanding of Ezra 7-9. And I don't see how we can reject that message because, and you can't say that you've accepted Ezra 7 now if you reject the chronology that results from it. Because I know not everybody was there, you know, who's following this movement, but in 2013, what Ezra 7 9 did is it brought to us an understanding of the symbolic use of dates. The first day of the first month became a symbol. The first day of the fifth month became a symbol. And we began to apply that symbol to things like verses. We had some of that with the 2520, where people were using numbers and counting and measurement of the sanctuary. But with, with the use of dates in the way that they were being done, we really didn't have that as developed. But it all came with an un unfolding of understanding of the first and second messages, where they were placed and their purposes and no one else understands Millerite history even people who claim to go back to Millerite history what they are doing is they're trying to go back to the beliefs of the Millerites so they're, they're rejecting any advanced light that came except little bits here and there that they can sort of fit in with an understanding of Millerism. But they, they believe that somehow the pioneers were correct about everything. Is it true that the pioneers were correct about everything? No. No, they were, there's lots of things they did not understand. So, you know, I run into these groups who will say, well, you have to accept, um, the 6,000 years is beginning in, in 4,157 BC because that's what Samuel Snow taught and what Miller taught about chronology. Um, for instance, that's just one thing. But, you know, there'll be all kinds of different views, what they thought about uh, the Godhead. And they'll, of course, pick and choose ones who think like they do um, and reject others who don't think like they do, right? Because there wasn't really agreement 100% on all of these things by the pioneers. Different pioneers had different views. And that's because the Millerite movement wasn't focused upon doctrine. It was focused upon prophecy. And so you had various people with different views uh, who came out of the Millerite history on all kinds of things. So, um, you know, we can't just go back 
to Millerite history. What we need to do is understand Millerite history. We need to understand why they believed and what they believed and how that parallels our own time. And only this movement does that. So when Jones talks about this message and the messengers and how we're going to treat them, um, I would think it's because people are unconverted that the message and the messengers have been treated that the way they have, whether by the church or whether within this movement. So he goes on, if none of the references presented in this chapter were available to us, logic and simple reason would dictate some conclusions. A loud cry was to have an effect on the closing of the work, like fire that goes in the stubble. Review and Herald, December 15th, 1885. The final movements will be rapid ones. But instead of going like fire in the stubble, there has been a century of protracted smoldering and smoking, inching along while human souls are being born faster than we can reach them with our message. The only reasonable conclusion is that the fire was put out by human, not divine, instrumentality. Uh, the second point, when the loud cry comes, says John the Revelator, it is to be light which will lighten the earth with glory superseding all previous displays of heavenly power. The kings of the earth have not yet stood afar off with the merchants of the earth, bewailing the fall of the great Babylon, brought to naught in one brief hour by the mighty preaching of the true loud cry. At the light of the fourth angel's message, mighty message, began to shine in that strange and impressive way in 1888. The only reasonable conclusion is that the light was put out by human instrumentalities. So, when we think about this, of course, we know that the loud cry began in 1888, but that message was rejected. And so we know in our history, for the loud cry to have its power, it requires a repeat of the first and second angel's messages so that we can then have a third, right? That, that's the whole basis of this movement. And we know that many people in this movement are jumping the gun, right? They want to run ahead of, of what God says has to occur. So the first work that has to occur is our own conversion. That is, we have to internalize these messages, the first and second angel's messages. And we have to pass through that experience. And, and this movement is passing through the experience of these messages. But we are, we still have a work to do on our, in, within our own hearts, within this movement. And when we look at it from a human perspective, it's an impossibility. But there is in this message of righteousness by faith, which is not just the third angels, but all three messages are the messages of righteousness by faith. It's just that the third angel is my righteousness by faith in verity, in reality, in experience. It's when that the, the work of righteousness by faith has accomplished something in the human being that then can bring light and glory to God. So we know that that has not yet happened. And in Jones' day and in Ellen White's day, right, they were agreed that the loud cry that had come, that the, the message of the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down, and now that we were in the time of the loud cry. But yet that was hindered, and we don't want that to be hindered again. When the 1888 message of righteousness by faith, the true beginning of the latter reign is accepted, there will be seen in the remnant church a revival of primitive godliness heretofore unknown. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. The only conclusion possible, the message of Christ's righteousness, was not truly received. Now, we, we've dealt with this a bit, and we're going to look into this in a lot more detail. One is about what the message is, 
and how it has been distorted, even within conservative Adventism. That, that we have the words or the form of righteousness by faith. People will say Jesus had a sinful human nature, all these types of things that they'll get right. But there's many things that they get wrong. And, and so we want to understand that. And so it's not just that the message hasn't been received. It's been distorted, manipulated and packaged in such a way that people think they have the message of righteousness by faith. But really what they're teaching is righteousness by works. <clears throat> the fourth point, the message being of God in a special sense, the authoritative, responsible and persistent opposition to it constituted a spiritual defeat for the Advent movement. But this defeat must be recognized as a battle in a larger war and not the losing of the war itself. So this is an important point, of course, which we have an advantage over many Seventh-day Adventists. So we understand Millerite history and we understand the aftermath. We understand how the first and second angels messages were rejected. And we see we see better what the larger war is and how it is to be one ultimate. So he's, when he says such a view of the matter will require that this generation recognize the facts of the case and thoroughly rectify the tragic mistake, this can be done and the living righteous God will help us. This has to be good news. Now, when it comes to this generation, this is 1987, I'm there in this history studying these things, reading Wheeland in short reading, um, you know, other materials, the twins, um, can't think of their names. Um, and, and reading lots of things about what's going on, reading Jones and Wagner, reading Spirit of Prophecy, understanding some things about this message, but not having any idea about Millerite history, focused upon the third angel's message without any real understanding of the first and second. And, and that's where we have this advantage. We can see the part that the first and second angels messages play and how they provide the second angel when it joins the third. That's Revelation 18. That's the second angel. And you can't have a second without a first. You can't have a third without a first and second. So we're in the time of the third angel. But that second angel's message has to be received and accepted. It's a part of, of the everlasting gospel. And this is the advantage we have. <clears throat> so there's an additional note here. Um, the official correspondence in the Battle Creek archival files corroborates Ellen White's and Jones' testimony regarding the negative attitude of the most responsible leaders at Battle Creek. A.T. Jones said that there was a secret antagonism always carried on that's letter to C.E. Holmes, May 12th, 1921. The letter to the, of the General Conference Secretary, the letters of the General Conference Secretary, Dan T. Jones, uh, illustrate how this attitude functioned. Uh, although he was deeply prejudiced against the 1888 message and the messengers, a few weeks after Minneapolis, the Holy Spirit impressed him with clear evidence that Jones was a true messenger of God. He writes to a friend, we have had good meetings here. Brother A.T. Jones has been doing most of the preaching. I wish you could have heard some of the sermons. He seems altogether different from what he did at Minneapolis. Some of his sermons are as good, I think, as I ever heard. They are all new, too. He is original in his preaching, and in his practical preaching, seems very tender and deeply feels all he says. My estimation of him has raised considerably since I have seen the other side of the man. And that's a letter to J.W. Watt, January 1st, 1889. But Dan Jones becomes a man convinced against his will. It is a phenomenal, it is phenomenal how good leaders can, could harden their hearts against what they clearly saw to be credentials of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand how this happened, for we today are in grave, grave danger of repeating their history. As Luther said, we are all made of the same dough. A year later, for some strange reason, 
Dan Jones has led his heart, let his heart become hardened against the 1888 messengers. Uh, while during the same period, Ellen White's attitude toward them has become increasingly supportive, here we see a mysterious ferment of the human spirit. As a responsible, responsible administrative officer, he writes to the leadership of the Missouri Conference, his home area. He must communicate his mistake in judgment. Here he is, and uh, here is an under the table kind of influence operating the secret antagonism. A.G. A.T. Jones spoke of. I think an institute in Missouri would be a splendid thing, but I believe an institute on a quiet plan would be just as valuable to you as to make great parade of it and get in. Elder A.T. Jones and Wagner. To tell you the truth, I do not have very much confidence in some of their ways of presenting things. They try to drive everything before them and will not admit that their positions can possibly be subject to the least criticism. In fact, they do not dwell upon any other subjects scarcely than those upon which there is a difference of opinion among our leading brethren. I do not think you want to bring that spirit into the Missouri Conference. So this is 1890. So the 1888 messengers probably never knew why their ministry was not welcome in Missouri. Dan Jones' informative letter to G.I. Butler regarding developments in Battle Creek revealed the antagonism operating he encourages Butler in his opposition to the message. I'm glad indeed that you are looking at matters from the standpoint that you do and are not getting discouraged and bowing down under the load that seems to be thrown upon you. I have often thought of what you said to me last winter, that the California fellows, Jones and Wagner, would be on an editorial staff of a review in less than two years. You should not be at all surprised if an attempt in that direction was made inside of that many months, but I feel sure that it would meet with very very strong opposition. The strong opposition he anticipated erupted like a volcano within his own soul during the following winter of 1890. Wagner one day announced to, in his Bible class that on the next Monday morning, he would discuss the two covenants. He had been officially invited, even urged, to leave his work in California and teach in Battle Creek. He naturally assumed that he was free to present the gospel as he understood it. But when Dan Jones heard the news about the two covenants, he could not contain himself. He immediately took steps to stop Wagner, appealing to Uriah Smith and even to Ellen White for support. He was so deeply stirred by the incident that he wrote about it at considerable length in letters to G.I. Butler, O.A. Olson, J.D. Pegg, C.H. Jones, R.C. Porter, J. Um, Porter J. Antith antipathy for the message of the messengers. Well, of course... Oh, oh, pardon me, I skipped a line. J. H. Morrison, E. W. Farnsworth, R. A. Underwood. His letters cannot disguise official antipathy for the message and the messengers, while, of course, professing acceptance of the doctrine of justification by faith. We can be grateful that he was a pro prolific letter writer, for he gives valuable insights into the behind-the-scenes attitudes of leadership. He discloses his inner feelings with candor. His continuing heart opposition to the message was evidently a heavy burden to his conscience, like Saul's kicking against the pricks. Concerning this confrontation with Wagner, he writes to Butler, there has never anything happened in my life that has taken me down like this. I felt just, I have just felt so thoroughly upset by the whole affair that I have hardly known how to act or what to do. When I saw what the lessons were, Sabbath school lessons on the covenants written by Wagner, I decided at once that I could not teach them. And after studying over the matter, some decided to resign as a teacher in the Sabbath school. I've been worrying and fretting over this thing until it has hurt me worse than a half year's work. What a spectacle. The General Conference Secretary worrying and fretting over what is in fact the leading of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. A glimpse behind the scene. Now, just a comment on this. Um, so we've seen this sort of secret type of opposition occurring in this movement. I've experienced a lot of it um, in the past with Tabo and Parminder. Um, and Jeff would tell me about it, what was going on, what was being said. Um, so there was all of this opposition to me as a person. And instead of people actually addressing the points, and I'm sure it happened to lots of other people as well. So instead of discussing and studying things, the messengers are attacked and behind the scenes actions are taken 
to stop or hinder people from teaching or doing or saying things. And this, of course, is not of God. Right? So we have to be willing to hear light wherever it comes from. Because there may be messages that come to us that at first strike us of the wrong way. Maybe it seems to be something that we don't agree with, or it seems to be something that attacks some special point we believe or understand. But if it's truth, it's truth, and it will be seen and demonstrated to be truth if examined. So uh, Dan Jones continues with a remarkable vignette of the Battle Creek administration, frankly, telling Butler of the official plan to hide the real facts from the students and let the matter in as easily as possible without attracting any more of the attention of the students of um, of the school to change to the change that was necessary. This would be politically astute. Wagner spoiled his plans by telling the open truth and let the whole thing out. And all I could do was say that we had thought best to ask Dr. Wagner to postpone the covenant question for the present. Ellen White, W.C. White, Wagner, and A.T. Jones labored to set matters right before the brethren in Battle Creek, with the result that the truth forced Dan Jones, Uriah Smith, and others unwillingly into a corner. Again, Dan Jones was candid in telling his friends of the discomfiture he had suffered. This left some of us in rather an embarrassing position. We had been laboring under a misapprehension and the props were taken out from under us. No one could dispute Dr. Wagner's word or Sister White's word. Dan Jones' humility and honesty are refreshing, almost naive, certainly so in light of the real truth, which he did not realize, that his antipathy was in fact directed towards heaven's gracious gift of the latter rain and the beginning light of the loud cry. He is dead set against this heaven-sent blessing and cannot avoid letting it be known. He is outstandingly a man convinced against his will, and thus of the same opinion still. Ellen White's famous March 16 sermon in the Battle at the Battle Creek at Battle Creek, manuscript 2, 1890, contains the statement. There was no reception of the message, and some dozen references to the continuing unbelief and rejection among the Battle Creek leadership since Minneapolis. Writing one day later, Jones, Dan Jones, laments his distress. It seems to me that her position is evidently the correct one, and the principle will apply to other matters ju with just as much force as it applies to the covenant question or the law in Galatians. I was just as certain as I could be that certain plans and purposes were being carried out by Dr. Wagner and others, and that certain motives were behind those plans and purposes. But it now appears that I was altogether mistaken in both. It seems strange how it could be so. <laughs> Every circumstance seems to add to the evidence to prove the things true. But regardless of all this, they have been proven false. So this is this should really teach us something about ourselves, not so much about Dan Jones, and how we can be so convinced of something even when we are in error. Writing to Butler 10 days later, his progress is reluctant, and he is still not clear. He is of the same opinion still regarding the message. As for Uriah Smith, he must blame Jones and Wagner for creating the misunderstandings. He cannot see them in the light that Ella White saw them as the Lord's delegated messengers. Perhaps we have been mistaken in some of our opinions that we have held, and I do not see now what can be done but to accept the explanations that have been made and act upon them. Sister White thinks reports that were brought to you from Minneapolis meeting were greatly exaggerated, and that you have not had a correct, got a correct idea in reference to what was going on there. While I hold the same position on the law in Galatians and the covenant question that I have always held, I am glad to have my mind relieved in reference to the motive and plans of some of the brethren. Let us hope that in the future our brethren will not act in such a way as to lay the foundation for unjust judgment on their plans and purposes. Letter March 27th, 1890. So we're going to stop there. Um, so we're going to pick this up next Friday. And any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Anybody? Okay. I'm particularly interested. I'm particularly interested in new light and how to test it um, mm -hmm. and how to know if it's actual light or light that is darkness. Um, right. So one of the ways, because we've dealt with that quite a bit in, in these series of studies, and, and the one thing that we can see is that if it's true light, 
it exposes our sins to us, as well as God's graciousness and power. So something that true light always brings a conviction of sin. It never justifies Mm -hmm. self. Mm -hmm. Never puffs up. Yeah. Because that's why men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. So true light is always going to bear a cross for us individually. And this is why this is why true light mm-hmm. is rejected. Right? Okay, so right. thanks for that. So let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, again, we thank you for all that you do in our lives, the struggles that we have faced, the battles with self, and the way that you have revealed your love and kindness to us and your mercy and grace. And we just Give everything over to you, Lord, our lives, uh, the things that you've given us to understand. We leave them in your hands and the people that we love and care for. We leave them in your hands. We ask that your spirit can work in a mighty way in this movement. And that you can use us to your glory. Be with each person studying these truths. We pray and ask in Jesus name. Amen.